Welcome to the Strategic Project Leader, where we help you leverage strategic project management so you can achieve your goals. Now, here's your host, Ola Alibi. Hello and welcome to the Strategic Project Leader, where we help you go further, faster in business and beyond. We are coming at you live from the SPL studio in Calgary, Alberta. And joining me from Kentucky, U.S. is my producer, Jay Francie. Jay, how are you today? I am very good, my friend. How are you? I'm Sick doing awesome sounds. this morning. Yes, I'm your host, Paula Alibi. I'm all about empowering you to leverage strategic project management. That's what I call my superpowers for driven professionals and entrepreneurs to go further faster. And I cannot wait to get into the topic for today. One piece that... Um, I love so much is the fact that project managers kind of feel that, you know, when you land a role, it's just going to be like, it's fine. You know, we're going to just deliver on time and on budget, right? However, a lot of times, lots of things go wrong. So I had to be talking about a lot of reasons why projects fail. A number of it could be like, you know, lack of planning, lack of executive support, you know, incomplete requirements, unclear expectations, scope creep, and the list goes on. However, there's one piece that stands out, which is project misalignment against strategic goals, because you can do everything right. You could communicate right. You know, you could be on time and on budget. But if your projects are misaligned, then goodness, the project is definitely going to go off the rails. And today we have someone special who's going to be diving deep into this because this is what he does. Like I say, he even does this in his sleep. I cannot just wait to like get to talk to Stewart today. Stewart is an award-winning leader. He has worked across, he's even worked for the World Bank, and he's all about helping organizations get this right. So can you just help me welcome Stewart Eston today? How are you today? Very good, Fola. Good morning. Morning, Jay. Great to talk to you. Good evening to you, right? Yeah, kind of mid-afternoon. We're enjoying a bit of sunshine here for a change uh, in the UK. That's awesome. Great to have you. It's always nice to have a fellow Brit on the line, right? So we can talk a little bit and just, you know, do our thing. Yeah, I'm not sure this is the time to wave the British flag. Things are going kind of off the rails here, but that's that's know, fine. But... That's fine. We'll we'll ignore it. We'll do what Brits do. We'll put a stiff upper lip on it and have a have a nice cup of tea. Everything's better with a nice cup of tea. That's right. That's right. So, still, when it comes to project management. And we talk about aligning strategy and we talk about projects. You know, there's always multiple pieces. When do you come into the scene to make things better? Well, so the, here, I mean, here's the big, the big message, I guess, is that the, the only reason that we do projects at all is to implement business change, to implement business strategy. And so, um, so people usually think of, a strategic alignment as being this thing that you do once a year. It's a, it's a, it's a budgeting exercise, right? Everyone fights over budgets and, and you're trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, who gets what slice of the pie. And, and, then, and then very often, you know, project management professionals kind of put it in a box and forget about it, right? They forget about this whole thing about strategic alignment and, and prioritization and all that kind of good stuff. But the truth of the matter is it has a huge impact on not only the value that you deliver as a, as a, as a project organization and as a business, but it has a, a huge impact on project success rates themselves. Um, so, so we may well dig into that a little bit later on and how, how, does, that, uh, how does that work? But I, I, I guess the, the, the big thing is um, to, to understand the potential impact that PMO leaders in particular can have on the overall performance of the organization just through this, this one act of strategic alignment. Um, so there were a couple of um, a couple of studies done uh, a few years ago, looking at government agencies and looking at businesses as well, and they looked at the overall performance of the organisation. Right? So so not just you know how many projects did we deliver. Right? That that's that's rather that you know that's rather tactical and boring, frankly. Right? But they looked at the overall delivery of their mission of their strategy, and what they found was that. Um, and of course, organizations vary in their, 
their ability to achieve their strategy. And what they found was that 80% of that, that variation between companies was explained by one thing. And that thing was strategic alignment, the degree of strategic alignment. So, so when it comes to boosting the overall performance of the organization, right? It's not about how many projects do you implement? It's not about was your project a month late or 15% over budget? I mean, those things matter, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to the overall performance of the organization, this strategic alignment idea is probably the most important thing, not just for the PMO, but for the whole organization. And, and most, most leaders and most PMOs um, don't fully appreciate that. You know, that's a, a major point that you just raised there. First of all, when you're dealing with some projects, project managers and PMO managers need to understand that they actually drive in strategy, period, right? When there is a change that needs to happen, when, you know, we need to do like positioning, if it's um, for market indicators, whatever that is, projects are the ones that help drive strategy. But the number one question that I ask, you know, a lot of my mentees is, how exactly is your project tied back to that strategic objective? They just feel, oh, yes, I was just handed over a project to do. I'm just going to be implementing this couple of systems. And that's, that's it. Forgetting that. If you do everything right, just as Steve just said, you could deliver the project on time, you could do everything 100%. But when there is that misalignment, or even if the market has actually just, you know, had a major shift, you know, then that project pretty much has already failed. And I'll give an example. I had um, a client where they were implementing Oracle at that particular time. And for whatever reason, things were not going as great. But some senior leaders had had some other conversation with SAP and things were going behind the scenes and that shift was happening. And then they signed an agreement to push on that particular program. And, you know, I was talking to that program manager, like, you know, you you think you're implementing something, but do you know that, you know, there is a major shift at a senior level that's actually coming? So that already means that that project has to be stopped. So all the resources, all the time and everything that has been done. It's just all been put to waste. So how can, you know, project managers ensure that, first of all, that they are aware of what's going at that particular high level? Because at a lot of the time, PMO managers, even at times, are not even part of the conversation as well. Mm-hmm. Prioritization is already done at, you know, at the senior executive level. And then they just get handed over the, the piece to say, just go track it. You know, it's like we're just, just pushing papers and stuff. So how can they ensure that they can get a seat at the table within those conversations? Great, great, great question. Um, so, so a couple of th- couple of things came out of what you you just said there, Fola. So, so what I'd like to do is start with a story, actually. So, a million years ago, I joined a new company, and uh, we we did uh, we did billing software for for large telcos. And I joined, and and I had P and L responsibility for the the two biggest uh, two biggest customers. And um, I, I had no large project experience. I didn't know one end of a project from another at the time. And uh, so, so the project managers we were just kicking off, you know, this thirteen million dollar billing replacement project, really big deal. And um, so they were just having the, the project kickoff meeting. So they, were, they pulled the whole team together. There were about twenty people in the room, and and our project manager. Kind of looked at me and he's like, Stuart, you don't know the company, you don't know the industry, you don't know project management, but you own PL for this. So, so why don't you come along and sit there and, and but just keep quiet, don't say anything, don't do anything, right? So, so I, I rocked up to the meeting and the customer's project manager stood up, right? And he, he did this, he did the whole thing, you know, it's, it's like it's like the beginning of a wedding, you know, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. To do this, to, to do this billing project, and to implement a billing system, right? So he got about that far, and my hand goes up. Right? My project manager is looking at me. He's like, "Stuart, didn't I tell you just don't say anything, don't mess anything up for us, right?" And and so so the guy says, "Yeah, well, yeah." I said, "Well, we're not here to implement a billing system, are we?" And he was, he was like, well, I hope so, because we're, we're paying you $13 million to do that. Yeah, he yeah. said, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're not paying us $13 million to replace a billing system. You're paying us $13 million to grow your revenue. 
Right? And there was just this kind of silence in the room for, for a few seconds while everyone thought about that. And he went, yeah, you're right, we are. And, and that changed the direction of the whole project because suddenly people weren't having conversations about what functionality do we deliver. They were having conversations about what do we need to deliver to deliver the business value, right, right. to deliver the strategy. And so, so what's the first thing? What's the, the, the for, so for if you're a project manager, what can you do? Well, go sit down, set your project sponsor down before you even have the kickoff meeting and make sure you understand what's the outcome that's required. Not the outputs, not the, not the deliverables, but what is the outcome that's required and what does it take to achieve that outcome? What needs to change to achieve that outcome? And start there and make sure that everyone on the project understands that. Right? So that's, that's, that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing, you, you mentioned prioritization. You, you kind of said, yeah, oh, well, prioritization is done and you know, it's up on, up on Mount Olympus, right? The gods do that. And then it's handed down. And, and, and that's true from a, from a project manager's point of view, right? You get given the project and given responsibility to go and do it. That's fine. But at the PMO level, actually, I would argue that's not true. The PMO is the translator, right? So, um, so I, I, have you, 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 do, you, do you know who Janus is? The, the Roman god Janus, two-headed yeah. Janus? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so the idea of two-headed Janus is, is that he was actually the, the, the gatekeeper. He was kind of the god of transitions and the gatekeeper um, to, to the gods. And that's what the PMO is, right? You, you've got to be able to speak executive language. You've got to be able to speak project language, right? You've got to, be this, you've got to have these two heads, one that faces, faces the gods and one that faces the, the, the people down in, in project land. That's right. And... And that process of prioritization is how you, in a way, translate you know, the, the will of the gods into something that mere mortals can, can execute. Right? Right. And, and, and the key word in all of that that, 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 I, that, that I threw out there was process. Right? Prioritization is not a meeting. It is not an event. It's not a budgeting event. It is a core strategic planning process. Right. And it, it should be ongoing. And part of that process should be capturing and documenting what the intended business goals are. Right. So, so I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know whether um, everyone knows the concept of the, the OKRs. Right. OKRs seem quite, quite fashionable at the minute. So it stands for objectives and key results. So, you know, if you're an old man like me, you know, you re you'll remember balance scorecards and things like that. That's right. You still <laughs> use them, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Well, OKRs is kind of the 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 next version of that that's meant to be more action and forward looking and all that kind of stuff. So it's um, you know it, it's uh, it's it's all good fun. So OKR, objective and key results. So so really, what you should be thinking about at the portfolio level is what are our strategic objectives. Right? What are we trying to achieve? So we're trying to grow revenue. We're trying to enter new markets. We're trying to do whatever it is, right? What are the key objectives? And then for every project, you want to be really focused on the, uh, on the KRs, right? the key results for that project that contribute to your strategic objectives. And often I, I hear people in portfolio land talking about, um, you know, which, which initiative, which strategic initiative does your project support? And I think that's I think that's not not the right way to look at it, right? It, it's kind of a natural way because people, particularly project people, like to you know you, you you kind of have projects that roll into programs, programs roll up into initiatives, and so on, right? Yeah. But but actually, it's the strategic objectives that we should be caring about. We should be asking, what is this project contributing to the to these objectives? I don't know. Does that make sense to you, Fola? Oh, 100 percent. So because the strategic objectives are the ones that are, are, have already been set. Right. And if your, your projects and programs don't tie back and align to that, that's where everything obviously goes to go south. But to your point, you know, the conversations that needs to be had, especially from, you know, the project management level that goes right up. Have, for me, having managed a lot of PMO offices for over a decade, I have seen different shapes and sizes of it, you know, where you have a PMO that 
you know, it's actually strategically aligned. We sit there, we know, we talk about the strategic goals and objectives. We put together, you know, the criteria for measuring that. We agree on what value actually means as well for the organization. And we actually drive that through the projects that we actually do. And we, we have like stage gates. In England, we do, you know, the, the OGC state gates as a couple of years ago. It's different here in North America though, but at every stage of the project, before you move into the next one, we go back and check the business case to be sure that we are still aligned to delivering what we said we were going to do and how that ties back to strategic objectives. And if the objectives have changed, we can go back and say, do we need to stop this project or do we need to um, restart something else? So these conversations have to be had. However, there are organizations where people are not privy to this information, right? And it's how can we get like project managers to kind of like be exceptional, right? You're not going to say, yes, I know I was handed over that project, as you said, and so I'm going to go over and do it. But to create a path where they can move from being a project manager to senior leadership, they need to be exceptional. They need to become strategic project leaders. That's why you spoke about the conversations that you have with your project sponsor, you know, having meetings with your PMO director, whatever that is, so that you know what exactly is happening. You know exactly how your projects track back to the strategic objectives. And even when it comes to prioritization, when those meetings are actually being had. Even if you're not preview to that information, but you can ask the right questions and you can be part of those conversations, you know, probably afterwards as well. So how, you know, how can a project manager then set themselves apart? Because I know that probably eight times out of 10, they really don't know what's really going on. And they just feel that, yes, I'm doing my piece though. How can they differentiate themselves and what, you know, what do they need to start doing differently so that they can know that this strategic piece is actually done by the gods, right? But they want to be privy to that so they can start making strategic decisions as well and create a path to senior leadership as well. Because our goal is to see how they can, you know, move up the corporate ladder and become better and help organizations achieve their goals. So what tips and strategies can you actually give us that can help? Okay, that, that's a really interesting question. So, so as a CEO of a small company, right? I'm, I'm not CEO of a uh, great big international corporation, or, or you know, I'm not, I'm not a commissioner of a government department or anything like that. But as a CEO, just a, a, a normal, you know, executive, um, the thing that that turns me off instantly is when people come and talk to me about the detail of their project. I'm not interested. As a C-suite executive, as a senior manager, as a project sponsor, I'm not actually interested in projects at all. I'm interested in business outcomes. I'm interested in my strategy and how we're going to get there. And I'm interested in things that are going to get in the way of, of executing that. So, so the first thing that I would, I would suggest to uh, PMO leaders and uh, project managers who are looking to, to progress in their career is go out and become, um, don't, don't lose that, that great project expertise that you have, but go and really invest in learning the language and the skills of business, right? of business strategy. What does that mean? Um, understanding uh, what the language is and the goals are across the organization. Go and go and have lunch with people from across the organization who are kind of your peers, but in different parts of the organization. And, and just ask lots and lots of questions. Right? Just why do we do that? How do we do that? Why don't we do it differently? Um, yeah, those kind of questions, nice open questions. And learn, 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 learn. And the more you learn, the more context you have to be able to interpret things that, that, that you hear, um, which lets you then really focus on the things that are gonna add value. It lets you go from, um, uh, you know, so, so if you think about um, uh, consultants, you know, if, you, if you're gonna hire a consultant, right? You can hire a consultant, you can say, great, I want you to do task one, two, and three, right? And they'll go and do it. And then there's another consultant and he, and he says, you know, you go to him, you say, I want you to do task one, two, and three. And they come back and say, well, what are you trying to achieve? And how can we improve the probability of getting that outcome? And, and all of that kind of stuff, right? Which one of those consultants would you pay most money to? Right? Probably not the one who would just go and do one, two, and three, right? Without thinking, without challenging, and without understanding, right? Because they're not adding any value. They're just doing stuff. They're not adding value. 
So, so it's about understanding enough context to be able to add value, to be able to engage with the content, to be able to challenge it, make sure you understand it. And then your job is to translate that into action, right? into, the, into the execution of, of that, that project. Does, does that make a sense? Things there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. go, Jay. You mentioned a couple of things. I just want to unpack a couple of them real quick. You mentioned the meeting you were having, and you mentioned the fact that you're a CEO of a small company. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if you could tell us from that meeting that you had, what lessons were, was it that you learned that you've taken back and now apply to your team? Uh, from the, from that kickoff meeting I talked about earlier. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, it mm -hmm. has to have changed the approach you take to leading your team now. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it was, it was, for, for me, that was one of those moments in, everyone has these moments in your career where you kind of go, oh. There was before that meeting and there was after that meeting, right? And uh, what, what happened after that meeting was that, you know, I ended up pulling together all our project delivery teams around, around these accounts and having a conversation with them that, 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 that just said, okay, guys, do you understand? Just asking the questions, do you understand what your customer is trying to achieve? Or are you just, are you the guy who's just doing one, two, and three? And, um, and it led me to take a much more active uh, approach be because our, our project managers and, and um, team members were, were very technical. Right? They, were, they were very technical guys, extraordinarily bright. This company hired people who, you know, when, <laughs> when I had the, my screening interview to join the company, the HR guy kind of said, Stuart, we're not sure you've got quite the, the, the educational pedigree that you need to, to join this company. I said, really? I've got a physics degree from Oxford. I, I don't have the academic chops, really? And he said, yeah, most of our people have got advanced degrees from MIT and Harvard and places like that, <laughs> right? So these were so really- mean Oxford is no longer good enough? Goodness, that's like- <laughs> Well, yeah, the, the Times just ranked it top university in the world for the second year running, right? So, so that's not good enough. Um, but, but the, but so, right. So really, really bright people. This isn't about being bright. It's about learning a new language and, and having the, the, the confidence and the knowledge to be able to have business conversations. So, so Jay, what I took from that was that, it, you know, effectively I was the program manager for, for, for these accounts. So I had to take that on and went and sat down with the CIO and the, the billing leads and all our customers to make sure that we mapped out what does a good outcome look like? And then worked with the team to help them to help them translate that into a plan of action. Right? What, so, so we understood what the outputs were that we needed to achieve the outcome. And you know, and and that uh, and interestingly enough, in, in that particular case, I'm trying to remember how many. In, I think we had about five different instances of, of billing systems across these companies, and and three of them were in trouble. Right. When, when I joined and within a year, year and a half, they were all running really well, right? really happy customers and, and growing, the, growing the business with the customer. And, and that would not have been possible if we didn't have these conversations about what are the business outcomes you're trying to achieve? And then do, do, that, do that planning that says, OK, if we want to achieve that outcome, these are the outputs that we need to deliver. So I think that was probably the biggest thing that, that changed. Well, that's another a good point you mentioned is, you know, how, how do we look at the outcome and we're, how can we get to the outcome of choice? And you mentioned that earlier too, when you said being a CEO, you're not as interested in the project itself and the details as you are the strategy. So as I work in a similar facet and we manage large teams that go in and have to accomplish a strategic goal, how are you getting your team to understand that you care about them while you're still trying to force or to work through an objective? Ah, right. So, so right. okay, that's a really interesting question, Jay. Thank you for that one. Nobody's, nobody's ever asked me that one before. That's really interesting because they, so um, there's, there's a construct that is, is quite popular in, in sort of business management um, called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And basically it's just, it's just this sort of, it's a useful tool. I, I don't know if it's, really real right i don't know if it's true in any any sense but it's a really useful tool and, and basically what it says is that that people have this sort of hierarchy of needs that that they want to have met right? so the first first level is about safety 
So, you know, have I got a safe job? I am, am I in a safe environment? Am I being bullied? All that kind of good stuff. And then it goes on to sort of, am I doing something interesting? And, and you keep climbing the ladder until you get to, am I doing something worthwhile, right? At the, the top, am I growing and learning and contributing to society? And, you know, the higher up the, that ladder you go, generally speaking, the happier, more motivated people are. And, and so I think a big part of this comes down to the fact that if you can help people understand why the project they're on matters, right? You're coming at level three or four on that Maslow hierarchy, right? You're not coming in at do this because I told you to do it, do this task because it's on your to-do list. You're coming in and saying, look, this is really important. We're a government department and we deliver these amazing services that, 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 that people out there rely on. You know, let's, say it's, let's say it's some kind of health service or something, right? We, we deliver these health services that improve people's lives. And if we can deliver this outcome, then this group of people are going to have a much better life. You know, you're going to be able to do hip replacements 10% faster or something. I don't know, making it up. But yeah, we're going to be able to do these hip replacements 10% faster, which means that we'll be able to treat, you know, 15 more, 15% uh, more people. You know, so across the nation, that's 120,000 people are going to have hip replacements that wouldn't otherwise have them, right? Suddenly, my task is really important. It's not just a task. It's not just something I'm being told to do by my boss. I feel like, hey, I'm contributing. I'm doing something really cool here. And when you do that, you know, typically people kind of really get with it, right? So, so this thing about strategic alignment isn't just good for the business. It's, it's good for the, the people on the projects as well. And, and let's be really clear, right, and, and honest with ourselves. People know when they're on a lemon project, right? People know when the project they're working on is worth nothing, that nobody cares. Um, and put in mind of, of someone I spoke to, I don't know, six, seven years ago, and she worked, funnily enough, for a totally different big telco. And she'd been there for about 10 years. She was a developer, right? And she'd been there for 10 years. And in that time, not a single line of code that she had written had gone into production, right? Because, because the leadership team was, chopping and changing and projects were getting cut and then you got a new project. And so a boss would, you know, imagine what she would, should say when a boss came to her and said, hey, I need you to work late tonight because we really got to get this one out. She's like, no, I'm, I'm going home. I'm going to spend time with my kids, <laughs> right? So, so working on the right projects, projects that matter, mean, yeah, everybody knows they matter. You feel motivated because you understand why it matters. You understand the contribution you're making. And then at the end of the day, you see it go into production and you see it make a difference. That is great. People, you know, uh, people love having a reason to go to work. And most people want to do a good job, right? And they, they don't just go because they get paid. They don't just go be, do things because people tell them to. They do them because they want to do it, right? They want to contribute and they want to feel like they're contributing. So, you know, doing this whole strategic alignment thing, Fola, that you were talking about earlier and, and cascading that down as a leader, as an executive, as a PMO leader, and then as a project manager, you're cascading it all the way down, helps everyone across the team be really motivated, understand what their, their contribution to the organization and to society at large is. And that's good. Oh, 100%, especially you talked about, you know, cascading this information now, because even the PMs, they need to understand that the bog doesn't actually stop there with them because they've got teams. Project managers are actually just managing the projects. So the people who are the walker bees, who are putting the codes together, who are building stuff, they need to know exactly what they're doing and why they're actually doing it as well. So as a project manager, you know, we spoke about, you know, understanding the outcomes of what you're trying to achieve, you know, speaking the right language and ensuring you can communicate with senior executive, but you mm -hmm. also owe it to your team members to ensure that, you know, everyone on the team understands why this project is actually being built or whatever that is. Your team members understand, you know, the role they play, you know, they understand, you know, what the constraints actually are and why it's actually really a constraint. Because that way people are motivated to come into work every single day because we spend the better part of our lives at work. So what can we do as leaders to ensure that people have the tools People have got the support and people even know why they're doing exactly what they're doing, which is great. So I want to take this um, another direction now. So from the overall um, process, so for the leaders who are actually watching us as well, where they say, okay, now see what I think we know what we're doing, right? We kind of have 
some numbers that we throw around. How do you get organizations to agree on what value pretty much means Mm -hmm. and how it can actually be unified? So it's like it's one language. Everyone understands that. So how do you get them to get to that particular space? That that's not an easy thing to do, um, is is the simple answer. So so let's try and figure out why. So so the goal here is we, we want to try and uh, be able. So we're looking for a way that we can align the jobs that we do, the projects that we do, with the goals of the organization. And the problem is that if you if you um, if you take all the leaders of the organization, take your C suite or the, the the most senior leadership your leadership team, and you put each one in a different room. And you give them a little, you give them a little survey, and you say, okay, write down what the most important things are for us to be thinking about in terms of, you know, what what the goals and outcomes of the organisation are, or what our strategy is. And uh, and then you collect those little surveys and you look at them, and you'll find that the sales guys survey will answers will be completely different to the manufacturing guys answers, and they'll be completely different with the uh, the CFOs answers and and they'll they'll all sort of be consistent with some big woolly um, uh, vision statement sure but they'll all interpret it differently and they'll all emphasize different parts of it and what this means is that when it comes to figuring out what projects to do they're going to value different projects differently so the sales guy is going to put a lot more weight on any project that is going to contribute to growing revenue manufacturing guy is going to put more weight on projects that are going to uh, contribute to product quality, efficiency, reducing waste, all that kind of good stuff. And that creates a real problem because um, if you're in project land, right, who do you listen to? Do you listen to the VP of sales or do you listen to the VP of engineering and manufacturing? And the, the answer is usually we listen to whoever shouts loudest. Yeah, we, we kind of, you, there's usually some kind of process. Maybe we've got a magic spreadsheet that we score stuff in or, or we let people come in and present to the executive team. And we, we sort of assume that the executives have this incredible, you know, we talked about them as gods on Mount Olympus earlier on. So they have this incredible omnipotence and they can figure out intuitively which projects we need to get done. But actually, what, hap- what actually happens is they have a political argument. They have a political um, competition to see who gets their projects done. Even when you have a magic scoring spreadsheet, like that that still happens. And and the reason is fundamentally, they are not aligned on what is important, what goals are most important. And so there's been, this is so important, right? So I'm, I'm I'm gonna drop back to statistics for a second, right? So this is so important that McKinsey did a study looking at the valuation of companies that did um, prioritization at the the highest level well, right? That they they really looked at what business are we in level prioritization. And those businesses that did that really well were worth about 40%, I think it was 40 or 45%. I forget the exact number, but it was that that ballpark. So let's say 40% more than the organizations that didn't. So this is this is real. This isn't just some. Oh, it would be nice if we all did. You know, we we're all pointing the same direction. You know, come by our thing. This really has an impact in the real world, right? So, so, so there's a lot of research because it's so important. There's a lot of research into how do you do it? How do we do it so it works? And um, the University of New South Wales, actually, in 2017, I think it was they did a kind of a meta survey where they pulled together all the research over the last couple of decades into over a hundred different methods for prioritizing projects. So everything from the beauty contest where people come in and you know, present their ideas and basically try and sell their ideas to the magic spreadsheet where you put some criteria down and you know, score projects and all that kind of good stuff um, through things like Moscow and there's just loads of different ways of prioritizing. Trick, yeah. And shockingly, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been talking about this since I saw that report back in 2017, and I'm still shocked by the results. Out of over 100 methods that they looked at, there were only two that they concluded were suitable in a large organization for prioritizing projects. Okay, now those two methods were called DEA, Data Envelopment Analysis. So if you've got your pen and paper, this is the time you pick up the pen and start writing, right? So the two methods were called DEA, Data Envelopment Analysis, 
and AHP, analytic, yeah. Yeah, analytic hierarchy process. Yeah. Now, um, AHP is much easier to implement than DEA. Right? So, so analytic hierarchy process is, is, is effectively the right answer if you're prioritizing in a, in, a, in a large organization. So if, you've, you know, if you're doing tens of projects and you've got multiple stakeholders, you're a large organization, right? So a large organization doesn't mean that you need to be you know, uh, you know, a $20 billion company. It just means you know, you, you've got to have different divisions and you know, different stakeholders and all that kind of good stuff and not just be small enough that the boss makes all the decisions. Um, so, so AHP is a very conceptually, actually, it's ridiculously simple. It's just like, uh, the concept is just like building a weighted scoring spreadsheet. You take, you know, you translate your business goals into a set of criteria, you weight those criteria and you score your projects against them. Right. And then you, you, you look at some nice pretty charts and decide which projects you want to do. And so, so conceptually, it's doing the same thing as, a, as a, a spreadsheet that you might put together. The difference is in how it does it. So that step where you're, you're getting agreement between the leadership team on what, what, what criteria are, import, are most important, for example, AHP has a very structured process that you go through to consciously and deliberately build understanding, agreement, and buy-in. From the leadership team and that's crucial right because if you don't have the buy-in to the scoring model that, that you use to score projects when you when you're trying to align them with strategy if you don't have buy-in into that definition of what strategically aligned means in other words right then then your prioritization will fail because people will just try and second guess it they're going to start playing politics again trying to jam their projects in because your scoring model is total nonsense and, and we see this all the time. You know, we, we, we um, you know, we're working with an insurance company, for example, in North America right now. And, you know, they'd spent a couple of years trying to do it using their PPM tool. And, and I don't know of a PPM tool that does this well at all anywhere. If anybody does know of one, let me know, because I haven't seen it. Um, so they tried for two years to do it in the PPM tool. And then they thought, then, then they kind of went, you know, that's just not working. So they, they brought in one of, the, one of the big consulting companies. I won't tell you which one. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But it was one of the, one of the big accounting firms. Uh, so they sent a bunch of suits down, charged them a load of money. They built the most amazing spreadsheet you've ever seen. And it didn't work. And then they put in AHP using our software. But, you know, they put in AHP. That was the important bit. And suddenly everyone got aligned. You know, their, their chief executive came out of the, this alignment meeting and sort of said, wow, you know, we're, we're having conversations now that we should have had years ago about, you know, is it more important to us? You know, let's, be, let's, let's get agreement on this. Is it more important to us to grow revenue or to reduce cost? Right? Th those kind of conversations. And you will find, if you ask that kind of conversation, that there are different opinions around the table. That's okay. But, but if you don't resolve that, if you don't get agreement on a common statement, a common position on that question, then, then you're opening yourself up to politics and biases and you know, he who shouts loudest and all that kind of stuff kicks in again. And, the, and, and being really clear, the PMI, the Project Management Institute, did some research uh, with the Economist Intelligence Unit. They looked at um, hundreds of portfolios around the world, came to the conclusion that a typical portfolio, um, uh, a typical portfolio will have 20% of projects that are so badly aligned with the goals of the organization that they should be stopped. Now think about that for a second. 20%, you know, think of that, about that person, that developer I was talking about, right? Who knows that she's working on the lemon, right? So 20% of projects are, are uh, so badly aligned, they should be stopped. Now, that's a pretty good definition of waste. And, but it's not just waste of resources, right? It's waste of human creativity that's and right. energy, right? It's a waste of people's lives. And that's, that's, it's just not okay. I'm sorry. It's it's not. We yeah. You know, we know how to fix this. So let's fix it. Let, I, I get kind of passionate about this because it, it 
you know, we see people who's, who put all this energy into projects that, that then get canned at the last minute or whatever it may be. And it's just, it's, it's immoral at, at some level. Um, so, so fundamentally, if you put in place this AHP process and do it well, right? So, so um, if you go and Google AHP, analytic hierarchy process, if you go and Google it, you'll find loads and loads and loads of sites that will talk about maths and they'll talk about eigenvectors and eigenvalues and all kinds of really scary things, right? Um, that's kind of missing the point. That's, that's what the academics focused on. And actually that stuff is important because that's what gives you validity, right? That's how you know it's gonna give you a good answer is because someone has done all that work. But to implement it, you don't need to know any of that stuff. What really all you need is, is a bit of software. Um, and you know, my company, Transparent Choice, does it. There are a couple others that do it, do it quite well. Um, but uh, you need a piece of software because it's actually, it's about the conversations that people have. It's about the collaboration. It's not really about the maths. It's about the collaboration and the conversations that people have. And you know, what you get when you do it properly is you get the leadership team coming out of the meeting, often saying things like, huh, this is the first time we've had, a, 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 you know, we've got a fully agreed strategy, right? And we know how we're gonna implement it. Um, that, that's amazing to me, right? I mean, how did you operate before this? Well, they operated with 20% waste. Um, so, so the bottom line is, you, know, you, you, can, you can fix it, um, uh, using AHP, that's the first piece. The second piece, and I want to come back to something that you said at, at the beginning, um, uh, Fola, was, was about, you, know, you were asking the question, you know, how does the project manager get to know this stuff, right? Get to know what the goals are and, and, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. So, so that's the second piece. So, so the first piece is use AHP or, or DEA, but AHP is easier. So I, I would recommend AHP. Um, the, the second thing is just really take on board that, that prioritization isn't an event. It's not a meeting. It's, it is a process and it should be a fairly continuous process, right? So, so you should be aligning, you should be collecting ideas. Well, actually, no, you should be defining your, your strategy, defining those criteria, those goals, using those to drive ideation first, right? So not just saying, you know, it's a bit like the Monty Python scene. I don't know if you've seen that. You know, bring out your dead, right? And there's, they're walking along going, bring out your dead, right? That's not how we want to do projects, folks, right? We don't want people bringing out the dead. We don't want them bringing out, coming in and saying, do you know this customer shouted at me last week, so I want a project, please. Right? That's not how we want to do it. We want to start with a statement that says, right, growing, growing uh, opening new markets and improving customer satisfaction are the two most important things to us. So I want everyone to go and come out with the come up with three or four projects now drive that that. address that. That's right. Right. Not not random projects that are knee-jerk reaction to an environment or somebody's vanity project or whatever it may. Not interested in those. We want you to come up with ideas driven by the strategy. Start there. That's great. And then and then you need to evaluate those ideas, score them against your criteria, sure. Right? Score them against that strategy. But but also build clarity around what the business case is what are the deliverables right what are the objectives this is contributing to you know thinking about that, those okrs what are the objectives that these this project's um, driving to contributing to and what are the key results we need to deliver as a project team in order to make that happen right and if you do that and have that as a process and that's transparent and that everyone can see and that cascades down to the project team then you're going to start to get much better outcomes. I think that's um, really great because even when you think about it from the almost tactical perspective, especially for project managers who are like running agile projects, you know, where they have a prioritization list, that same mindset can also be applied, right? You already know what the customer really wants. You always need to go back to the backlog to get what are the, the hundred requirements that came in and which ones are we going to go with? So tying it back to what exactly was this product really set out to deliver in the first place? So if you are building a particular functionality that doesn't actually give you that, you already know that that's pretty much wrong, right? So just having that mindset and, you know, scaling up at the strategic level and then bringing it back down at a tactical level, it's always going to be a win-win. So it's like, 
there is Absolutely. like um there is no part of it that you're not going to get the benefits of just doing the things right and tying back to strategic objectives. It is absolutely crucial that objectives are clear. You understand the big picture. You can speak the language. See what actually has actually said, go into the business, understand and find out, you know, what makes them tick? What do they actually do? Ask questions, then come back and implement that with your team and ensure that you are driving, you know, something that is actually huge that will add value to the organization. So that's definitely absolutely. awesome. Well, I know it's a, yeah. You want oh, sorry, to go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, and, and com, coming up a level again for from the project to the portfolio. Oh, yeah. right? So this whole strategic alignment thing um, uh, is really important be, when it comes to selecting the portfolio in the first place. So most organizations, almost every organization that we talk to um, has the same problem, which is they have too many projects. Right? Now, most people think, well, that's, yeah, too many projects, that's a bad thing, our people are stressed, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of self-evident. But actually, th 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 that's a problem, right? And, but actually, it's much, much worse than just having too many projects. Okay, so imagine, imagine a highway near you, right? And think of it at five in the morning, it's quiet. You got, you know, maybe 10 cars a minute going past. And so if you want to, you want to have more cars go past, you just put more cars on the highway because there's plenty of space, right? So that's great. And then as, as you get into the rush hour, it gets busier and busier and busier. And, and the cars start to slow down on the highway right? as it gets busier. And eventually, right, it's so busy, especially, you know, 101 in Silicon Valley and places like that. It's so busy that, the, that it just stops. The traffic just stops, right? You get a traffic jam because you have too many cars on the highway. Same thing happens with projects, right? So, so as you pile more projects on, Actually, your project delivery rate increases, and then it reaches a maximum, and then it starts to you know you see your project delivery rate starts to slow down. So having too many projects, it is a problem about oh our people are so stressed and everything else, but actually it's a really big problem because it reduces your delivery cadence, right? It, it slows down your project delivery flow if you have too many projects. So so this whole thing about strategic alignment and being able to pick the right projects is, is how we say no to projects and, and position ourselves so that we're at this point of maximum project flow. And, and usually for, you know, for most organizations, that's sort of 80, 85% utilization is where the, the curve really starts to, to, to drop down. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so if, you're, if you're working your people at sort of 95% utilization, you're actually getting less work out of them than you would be less productivity out of them. You have fewer finished projects than you would do if you were loading them about you know, 85%, 80, 85%, right? So, and, and the problem is that if you're not doing this strategic alignment thing, this prioritization thing properly, what happens is, you know, if you haven't got your leadership team aligned on what strategically, what is, you know, what our strategy is and how to measure that strategic alignment, what happens is that they, they fall back into politics mode and they just try and jam. I wanna, I'm going to jam one more project in, right? Because I think this project is more important than that one that we've said we're going to do. So I'm going to try and jam this one in, right? And it, it almost guarantees that you end up with too many projects. So it's really hard to fix that, that, that project flow problem, right? And project failure rates, because again, one of the most common causes of project failure is having too many projects or not enough resources, right? It's the same thing. So, so this is directly tied to project flow and project failure rates. And it's, it all comes back to this idea of not being able to properly measure strategic alignment and, and to be able to use that to drive prioritization. So if you can fix prioritization, you don't just fix the strategic alignment problem, you actually fix your project flow rate problem and you address a big chunk of the project failure challenges as well. Does that, does that tie in with your experience, Fola? Well, yes, it obviously does. And the, 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 beauty, the, the beauty about it is that it's exactly the same thing in almost all organizations have actually been in as well. But once we are able to like sit down and, you know, agree on what we really want to focus on and what the strategic objectives actually are, 
we can get those criteria as to how we're going to rank and rate them. People can come back with projects and then there's that easy flow. And then it obviously just cascades actually down. And it's not about who shouts the loudest and, you know, which is what right. you obviously find or who has got the highest title, right? Because if the CEO happen. comes and says, we have to do this, and then no one actually questions it. But if ahead of time, you can sit with senior leadership to say, really, what exactly are our strategic goals and objectives? We just want three at most, right? Then we can tie back to the criteria we're going to use to measure. We can get teams to ideate and create those um, particular projects that, that can actually drive our strategic goals and objectives. Then it's easier for the PMO team and the project managers to go off and run with the right projects that will be delivering strategic value overall. So definitely we are totally in alignment with that. Absolutely. And and, and it has a real cas cascade down. You know, if you look at some of them, you know, we've, we've talked about having too many projects being a leading cause of project failure and how that ties back to strategic alignment. But, you know, there are other causes of project failure that also tie back to, to alignment. So if you think about, um, you know, lack of executive sponsorship, right? How often have you heard people say, well, our project got into trouble because the executive sponsor just wouldn't turn up to meetings. Guess why he's not turning up? You're doing the wrong project, guys. He's that's not right. interested. He's not really interested, exactly. He's not right? interested. That, that's a sign. If he's not turning up, stop the project. Or at yeah, least ask the question. If he moves the needle, that's right. If he moves the needle for the organization, he will definitely be interested, right? To know where things are at, without a you doubt. You got so it. Outcomes over output, without a doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and even things like scope management. You know, how often have you heard of scope creep killing a project? That's right? what I said at the beginning, Ray. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you don't understand what the actual outcome that's desired, then how are you going to manage scope? Right? How are you going to make a judgment of whether this scope item contributes or doesn't contribute to our, the outcome that we want? And so you end up with gold plating, you end up with scope creep, you know, and, and that's, uh, that, so we all know the story. We've all lived it. Goodness knows how many times, right. I'm sure. Right? If you don't it, fix the bigger problem, right, you're just going to just like chase in shadows at the end of the day, right? So you can do everything right, as I said at the beginning of this particular stream, right? You said you could have the right budgets tracked, you know, be on time, whatever that is. But if there's that shift in strategic alignment, overall, the project will not be delivering strategic value to the organization. And so it's just been a waste overall. So excited for absolutely. sure. I think it's almost time for Project Lifestyle now. Is that right, Jay? Yes, ma'am. That's right. So I didn't actually hear the sound of sound plays. I always like to be always tie back everything back to our personal life. So now it's time for project lifestyle. I want to take strategic alignment and think about that, how we can apply this even in our personal life. So we've been talking about ensuring that we think about outcomes over output. So in your personal life, how aligned are you? Are you single or are you like, are you married? And do you think about the goals that you have and you feel that it's all about maybe the, the little things? Are you aligned when it comes to the big, the big rock? So for instance, it like family values, is it about how you want to like grow um, as a couple or is it about how you want to build um, the life that you guys actually want? Having strategic alignment at a very, very high level and having this conversation so that you on your partner understands where you're going is extremely important so you could say yes we could we can deal with the other the other pieces right i've seen people where they say oh i obviously wanted to have a child for instance when i wanted to grow up but i think my husband doesn't want that that already is a major misalignment so you need to ensure that as a family and as a whole having strategic alignment is absolutely critical have these conversations agree on them those are the big rocks that sits and sticks everything together so remember as i always say life is a project and every little piece that comes in as long as it's a goal or it's a needed change that is a project so it's definitely been fun today thank you so so much for actually being here i just want to just wrap it up today it's like see what what are your final words again back to removing it from the the, the very high level for the project managers listening and the PMO managers, what are the, the three things that they can just take away in action right away and make a shift just the way you did after you had a meeting with your, with that actual client. So what can they start doing differently after this conversation? Well, I, I would say the first thing is make sure that for every project that you're, you're working on, that you understand what the, the outcome, the business outcomes are 
and and what it would you know what it takes to get to those business outcomes and that you orient all your action around that that, that would be kind of the first one the the second one i think would be to uh, again if you're a project professional then you have had drilled into you gantt charts and risk registers and goodness knows what else right and um, uh, if you are looking to progress beyond sort of project manager and, and into PMO and even beyond, um, uh, I would strongly suggest that you don't forget that stuff, but you go and read some business books, go watch some business videos, um, uh, you know, go follow Adam Grant and people like that um, so that you can develop those, those skills. And then, and then I think the final thing would be to make sure uh, really to echo your, your personal point at the end, Fola, to make sure you understand why you're doing this yourself, right? What is it that's motivating you and what you're trying to get out of life? Because it's not just about being a hamster on the wheel. It's about living a life that is the right life for you. And so, you know, as you're learning those skills, as you're expanding and, and delivering more value to your organization and to society, make sure that you, you're, you're prioritizing your own development in the direction that's that's good for you and your family absolutely thank you so much i cannot thank you enough for being here it's been an absolute pleasure we have a lot of questions have been coming i think we definitely need to get you back people want to dive into um <laughs> the um ahp and um, definitely for hard we're going to deal with that in another episode because we definitely run beyond time jay where can people actually find you thanks for being here People can find me over at jfrenzy.com. Fantastic. Stuart, goodness, thank you so much. There's so much to unpack. We didn't, didn't even get to like the criteria. There's so many pieces that I had I wanted to talk about, you know, that, but it just obviously shows that there's so much that people need to learn. We definitely need to bring you back. But the good thing about it is that Stuart has also given us some great freebies are going to be in the show notes like prioritization criteria things you can actually use and have those conversations with your leaders and without a doubt transparent choice is definitely a great choice when it comes to prioritization thank you so so much and where can people find you Stuart? um so so come to our website transparentchoice.com there you go thank you jay and um uh, and actually on that page that jay's showing you there's a there's a button at the top resources and in there, you'll find blogs, uh, you'll find uh, the ultimate guide that, that, um, that we're going to share after this, the webinars and ebooks on criteria and all kinds of other things. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff there that will help you get going, that will help you think about uh, this whole topic of strategic alignment and prioritization and how to start communicating that, first of all, to yourself and then to, to the rest of your organization. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It's been fun. It's been great. And I cannot wait to see you on the next one. Let's keep the conversation going. Send me a mail. Let me know how this actually went and tell a friend if this was actually valuable to you. And if you've got any questions, you can reach us on sblpodcast.com. And I cannot wait to see you same time next week. So Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be here talking and sharing. I appreciate you for being here. And have a <laughs>